Star Trek IV The Voyage Home completes the trilogy of Star Treks 2, 3, and 4, and I think very much in a satisfying manner. The film is vastly different to both Wrath of Khan and Search for Spock. The intention with this film was to make a major thematic and tonal departure to what had gone before, and the result is a film that was highly praised and successful with non-Star Trek fans as well. General audiences liked this film the most, though some hardcore fans feel the movie is too campy, comedic, and on Star Trek in tone and setting. I can see why some fans feel that way. I mean, it's totally understandable. There's no real cerebral science fiction component to the movie. There's no primary villain, no space battles, no Enterprise, except for the brief introduction of the new one at the end of the film. And of course, the story mostly takes place on Earth in the 20th century, with all of the contemporary energy, colour and life that that setting provides. So such a significant change of pace and environment was never going to sit well with everyone. But I personally love this movie and find it a refreshing change. The film is affectionately referred to as The One with the Whales. For this film, Leonard Nimoy had a free hand to really pursue his own vision as director, and he wasn't as creatively restricted as he was when directing Star Trek III The Search for Spock. And this ultimately allowed himself and producer Harv Bennett to make a more light-hearted movie, though the stakes are in fact higher in this film than they were in Star Treks 2 and 3 because the fate of planet Earth itself literally hangs in the balance. During production, a role was developed for actor Eddie Murphy. He was going to play a college professor. Obviously, Murphy was a big star at the time. He ultimately turned down the part, and the character was reworked and rewritten to become Dr. Gillian Taylor, played by Catherine Hicks who would also serve as a love interest for Captain Kirk. I think if Eddie Murphy had have been in the film, it would have made The Voyage Home even more quintessentially 80s than it already is. The script was divided between two writers, Harve Bennett and Nicholas Meyer. Bennett wrote all the 23rd century stuff, which is to say the beginning and the end of the film, whereas Meyer wrote all of the stuff that was based in 20th century Earth in the middle of the movie. So that's the reason the film feels so different in terms of energy and tone from beginning, middle and end. The film picks up three months after the events of Star Trek III. The Enterprise crew, sans the Enterprise, which was destroyed in the previous movie, have been exiled on Vulcan and are due to return to Earth to face the music with Starfleet because of their theft and destruction of the Enterprise and because of disobeying a direct order. They'll head home using their captured Klingon bird of prey and now resurrected, though still recovering Spock, will also join them. Meantime, a deadly, mysterious alien probe heads to Earth and begins causing havoc on all technology, including starships. The Earth is being bombarded by storms, and the skies are filled with a blanket of cloud, blocking out the sun. Starfleet is forced to send out a distress call. Did anyone else think that the dark cylindrical alien probe kind of looks like dog food if it if it came out straight out of a can whole? <laughs> Maybe it was just me. So the Enterprise crew received this distress call and Spock deduces that the strange transmissions it's making are in fact whale song, specifically a form of communication with humpback whales. And humpback whales are extinct in the 23rd century. The probe is not interested in humans. It wants to speak to these whales that no longer exist. So the story plays into the enigmatic and mysterious nature of whale song. In some ways, this story has similarities with Star Trek The Motion Picture, only instead of a probe that comes to Earth to make contact with its creator, human beings, lest it destroy the planet, this time a probe is coming to Earth to communicate with whales, lest it destroy the planet. Though the execution of the stories is obviously vastly different, and this isn't a cerebral space opera like the motion picture. In the 23rd century, whales, like I say, are extinct, and so the only course of action to take is to find some humpback whales in the past. So they make a dangerous slingshot maneuver around the sun and head back in time, going all the way back to 20th century San Francisco, thanks to some excellent calculations from Spock. Now, to be fair, it is a bit of a stretch to just assume that any random humpback whales would be able to reply in the required way to this mysterious alien probe. 
I mean, suppose the probe was looking for a specific humpback whale to communicate with. They'd be really screwed then, wouldn't they? What follows is an enjoyable romp for the Enterprise crew, getting to see them in an entirely alien world we would never usually see them, the present day. At least, you know, the present day of 38 years ago, 1986, the year the film came out. So we get plenty of of fish-out-of-water hijinks, no pun intended. Some of the light-hearted highlights of the movie include Scotty making use of a Macintosh and talking directly into the mouse, thinking that it's some sort of microphone, Kirk and Spock being exposed to punk rock, and them trying to understand profanity, referred to as colourful metaphors, and Spock being confused by the idea of exact change for the bus. So, with the Bird of Prey safely cloaked in Golden Gate Park, the team will split up. Kirk and Spock will find the whales. McCoy and Scotty will find the materials needed to safely contain the whales aboard the Klingon Bird of Prey. Sulu will find a helicopter and transport the materials aboard. And Chekhov and Uhura need to find a suitable nuclear power source for the energy-depleted Bird of Prey. They find this on the aircraft carrier Enterprise, and of course we get Chekhov's immortal line, NUCLEAR VESSELS! Kirk and Spock have to win the trust of Dr. Gillian Taylor to convince her to part with two whales, who she is looking after in an aquarium. It's no mean feat, as she obviously doesn't believe they're from the future. The relationship between Kirk and Taylor, and also Spock as the awkward third wheel, creates some humorous moments in the movie. And later, they have to rescue Chekhov from a hospital after he sustains a head injury following his capture on the aircraft carrier. The hospital scene offers some slapstickish kind of comedy for a change, and generally speaking, the film does a good job blending the levity with the more serious elements of the story. There's some decent humour and some wonderful banter between the characters, and all of the cast get a decent amount of stuff to do. What I really enjoy about this film is that it's an easy watch and a really good family film with a feel-good factor about it. Ultimately, there had to be some kind of redemption arc for the crew of the Enterprise, given their illegal actions in the previous film, where they disobeyed direct orders. They would have been facing court-martial, at the very least, and most likely imprisonment, with Kirk receiving the biggest punishment. But balanced against saving the world from the alien probe, none of that stands. Kirk is ultimately reduced in rank to captain, so he can return to the position for which he has always been at his best, the captain of a starship once again. The crew are celebrated as heroes, and the Klingon bird of prey apparently disappeared to the bottom of the San Francisco Bay because the cloaking device had reactivated, and it would eventually make its way to the Fleet Museum, and over a century later it would have its cloaking device stolen and put into the USS Titan A, which would eventually be renamed the USS Enterprise NCC-1701G. See? Full circle there, folks. But that's another series. Also, Kirk gets snubbed by Jillian at the end of the movie. I mean, the guy is like the biggest legend in the Federation. And he's just been celebrated for saving the world. And she's like, yeah, I'll I'll see you later sometime. Uh, All the best. Gotta go. Man, that was cold. The crew flies off to get their new starship, and for dramatic effect, they weren't told, before they got into the space pod, they weren't told what the name of the ship was going to be, yeah, as if. Now, originally, visual effects supervisor Ken Ralston wanted to design a more advanced class of starship for the Enterprise A, but to save money, the same model was used as the previous version, hence the Constitution class once again, though the unofficial explanation as to why it looks the same is that The USS Yorktown or some other pre-existing Constitution class was renamed, basically. Speaking of models, the close-up shots of the whales in this film were actually done with animatronics, which is really quite incredible because they're very believable. They work really well. Now, technically speaking, Star Trek V The Final Frontier does continue shortly after the events of Star Trek IV. But, and I'm trying to be delicate here, the cast had aged noticeably from 1986 to 1989, making it not really believable, whereas from Star Trek II through to Star Trek IV, a span of four years, the actors really hadn't aged all that much, making the films feel like they were almost shot back to back. 
Overall, Star Trek IV is a nice, refreshing break from the usual format of Star Trek films. Now, format breakers are occasionally welcome in long-running franchises, offering some variety, while still remaining true to the Star Trek ethos at its core. You can't make too many of these kinds of movies, however, otherwise you'd alienate long-time fans, but I think the commercial and critical success of Star Trek IV did create a problem for the franchise down the line. The studio, which I think has a history of not fully understanding the franchise, took the success of Star Trek IV as a sign that it was possible to make a Trek movie for a general audience. As a result, subsequent attempts were made to try to do so, with less than stellar success, Star Trek V tried to insert too much silly humour and failed. Star Trek Insurrection also tried to produce a more light-hearted, planet-based, family-friendly movie with silly jokes and romantic elements, only for it to fail rather miserably. And the J.J. Abrams movies were all attempts to make Star Trek appeal to a more general audience, especially those who enjoy a generic action popcorn movie. I think this is perhaps an unfortunate legacy of Star Trek IV's success, which was never recreated after this. The mindset seemingly was, well, if this worked, why can't this work? Which is a major misunderstanding of the source material of Star Trek. Star Trek IV worked because A, the characters were still in character and well-written, and B, the format of Star Trek was maintained. Only the setting of most of the film's story was different from the previous films whereas films like Star Trek V or Star Trek Insurrection failed because they made the characters say and do silly things for arbitrary reasons. Mind control from Cybok, metaphasic particles from the Baku planet, whatever. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home didn't need such gimmicks because the writing was just absolutely excellent. Anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. What do you think of Star Trek IV The Voyage Home? Take care. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. The Dave Cullen Show is made possible by you, my generous subscribers. If you'd like to support my work, head on over to my subscribe star linked below in the description box. And for a pledge of as little as $1 per month, you can help to keep the show going. I'm also doing one-to-one -one monthly subscriber chats. Thanks again. Take care.